Scripture reading in God's Word this morning is John 15. I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in His love. I have told you these things so that you will, <clears throat> you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. This is my commandments. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. So be it. Thing to talk about about soldiers today <laughs> but the last song was dead on the money and it always is because that comes from 1 John 5 4 everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has become a child of God and everyone who loves the father loves his children also we know we love God's children if we love God and obey his commandments loving God means keeping his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome verse 4 which is where this uh, him says that it comes from for every child of God defeats this evil world and we achieve this victory through our faith that's so important to remember and who can win this battle against the world only those that believe that Jesus is the son of God so you got her there at the end hit it right on what my message is going to be because if this week if you don't if you didn't follow along Shame on you if you didn't, but you should have. We read from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter, all the way to 2 Corinthians 1. This chapter about suffering so that you can receive comfort, and I'm going to try to tie all that together today. But let's start with prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you that you are a loving, compassionate, faithful God to a disobedient, unfaithful world. Father, we thank you that you don't have any problem calling us your own child, that you do that all because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. In his obedience, he left heaven and suffered and died for our sins, not for his will or his might, but for yours, O oh Father. And he has called us to live a life of love. Those that truly believe, those that follow his commandments, Lord, help us to realize that, to deny ourselves and to follow after Jesus even if that means taking up a cross. Lord, we thank you and praise you for the freedoms that we take so much for granted in this world. Let us not become lazy and complacent, but let us be warriors for the kingdom. Let our light shine, Lord, not our lights, but Jesus' light shining through us, that we may bring glory and honor to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So I told you where we started. And kind of told you where we ended. Let's kind of wrap up in between there. And I've got a little video in between that will explain a little bit too. If I had a title, it would be what, Kim? You got it? I gave it to her so she could put up so she would know. And then they talk to her and she loses it. It would be called, Paul said in chapter 12, I'm going to show you the most excellent way what is he talking about and everything that you've read talks about this most excellent way it's a four-letter word a good four-letter word l-o-v-e it's what motivates us it what it compels us is christ's love compels us that god would love his only begotten son <sighs> how can you be quiet how can you be silent how can you not be changed if God loves even his enemies, and we have problems with that verse, don't we, Merle? We, we have problems with loving our enemies, but that's exactly what God did, what Jesus did. When I suffer and stuff, I don't want the suffering to continue. I want it to end. And I haven't suffered anything like what the first church suffered. Yes, we as Christians suffer. We fight a spiritual battle. And don't think that you don't suffer just because you're not suffering on the front lines of the mission field somewhere. You suffer because there's sin in this world. And people look at you to see if your faith 
is real or not. So don't think that you're not suffering just because you're not out there on some foreign country spreading the word of God, planting wells and telling people about Jesus and bringing them medical care. You are his hands and feet wherever you are and the people that are around you, if it's your job place, if it's in your school, wherever it's at, are watching you. And one of the biggest ways they can tell if your faith is genuine or not are because the sufferings, the persecutions that come into your life. The church in Acts, when Peter was arrested and everything, they were fearing for their lives. They prayed for boldness to preach the gospel method, their message. There's nothing about taking away those fears, those sufferings, those persecutions. But it's natural tendencies of the flesh to want to do that because we don't have God's mindset. We don't know how He's working. But Scripture does tell us that He works all things together for good for those that love Him. And it tells us to love one another. 1 Corinthians 12 started this way. No, that was from last week, but I want to remind you because I know sometimes we forget yesterday, let alone a week ago. It started this way. Now about spiritual gifts, brothers, I don't want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. I start here again to tell you, you are being led one way or the other. If you don't believe me, let's go back to Exodus 20. And God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, physical and spiritual, because they couldn't worship the Lord their God. The whole reason that God said to release His children was so that they could go and worship Him. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in the heavens above or the earth below or in the waters beneath. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquities of the Father on their children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. But showing loving devotion to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. But you say, I don't have idols in my life. We don't have idols now. We don't have little statue, carved statues over here. We've just swapped one idol for another one. And if it were true where they might have had three or four idols sitting over in the corner, we've got hundreds of idols in our life. And even those things that don't seem like they're idols very well may be. Hunting. I didn't say that out loud, did I? Boy, that's an idol sometimes. And, oh, look, John's pointing his fingers at me already. Family. If you don't have faith that God can take care of them, and I'll point him right back now, because I know that man prays for his family all the time because he has faith. And I admire that faith, and I see that faith. And I'm not the only one looking for that faith. His kids are watching him. The world's watching him. And troubles Come, that's what we're getting to in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. It's a part of the Christian walk. It's not something you preach the first time to the first new believer or one looking because you don't say, hey, let's sign up and pick up this cross and go die because you won't get too many takers, will you? But if you truly believe, then you must. You have to. You're not Jesus' disciple if you don't deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow after him. Why do you think Jesus said it was hard, the way was narrow? It was harder for a rich man to get to pass through a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get into heaven. Not many find it. Why do you think God said in the Old Testament that there was only a remnant that was following him? That's not many. In Matthew 6, when Jesus started this new teaching, which was not new, it was explaining what the law really meant. And if you talk to somebody nowadays about the God of the Old Testament versus the God of the New Testament, they can't even understand the God of the Old Testament, but the God is still the same. It's a holy, righteous God who expects His children to be holy and righteous. The difference is, is we can't in the Old Testament because we don't have the power of God living inside of us. Now we do, and not only that, we are the temple of God. Paul says it over and over again. We are a royal priesthood, Peter says. We are ambassadors. That's a spoiler alert. You're going to get to that this week. We are ambassadors for the kingdom. 
as God was making his appeal of love through us. But Jesus says it this way, No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one, well, we've said we didn't hate God back there before when he said he visits the, he's a jealous God and he visits the iniquity of the fathers on their children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. Jesus says you can't serve two masters. You will hate one or love the other. We don't like to think we hate God. But if we're not lovingly following in Christ's footstep, sacrificial love, and we'll explain that a little bit more in a second, then we're really following after another master. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or about your body. What you will wear is not life more than food and the body more than clothes. Right after he says you can't serve idols and God, you can't serve money and God, you can't serve the devil and God, he says don't worry about the things because the things are what has distracted this world today. We don't work for clothing and food and shelter. We work for things. Can I say that we work for idols? Is that okay? How much different would your life be? Would your love be for one another? Would your time be to be the hands and feet of Christ if you weren't so busy working for idols? 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Oh, I'm going ahead of myself, but that's okay. That'll actually be end of this week? Let me think. I've got to count on my fingers. Three, two, three, four, five, six. Yes, we'll get to it Friday. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Not talking about marriage. For what partnership can righteousness have with wickedness? Or what fellowship does light have with darkness? What harmony is there between God and the devil? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? We are supposed to be part of this world. A set apart part of this world. Light in darkness. Walking by faith, not by sight. Through the sufferings, the trials, the tribulations that come to the Christian, to the believer. <clears throat> what agreement can exist between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell with them and walk among them and will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing and I will receive you. And I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Paul quotes from Leviticus, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Ezekiel, and 2 Samuel and all that. Telling us the standard of God. Nothing has changed. You are to be a righteous, holy people. In fact, now you're all priests. You all have the same mission. And as we're going to hear in just a second from Scripture, the new command is to love as Jesus loved you. Wow. <laughs> so is it God or Satan? Who are you following? Who are you serving? Is it Jesus or another antichrist? Is it the Holy Spirit or are you being led by another spirit to mute idols? Is it money? The love of money which is the root of all evil? Whether you think you have it or not in your life? Or is it the love of Jesus Christ that compels you to act and live like Jesus in this world? The way of the cross. Suffering and dying for someone else. Paul writes this to the church at Philippi. Therefore, if you have any encouragement in Christ, any, any comfort for his love, remember that word comfort because we get there by the end of this sermon. Should have got there yesterday, day before yesterday reading. Any comfort from his love, any fellowship with the, Spirit, with the Spirit. If you have any affection and any compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love being united in spirit and in purpose, being the church, the hands and feet of Jesus. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or empty pride, but instead in humility considers others more important than yourselves. 
Awkward silence. Not your wife, not your children, others. Remember the story where the religious leader wanted to, to justify himself and said, Who is my neighbor? Everyone you encounter. I hate driving down the road. I've told you that a million times. Yesterday, driving down the road, I had one stuck up my rear end before I got out of town. Sitting there, kept going like this, back and forth. So then I slowed down, and then they still behind me. Then passed me like they're going crazy, and I'm seeing this phone in a hand, and halfway in the ditch, and I'm thinking, oh. And it's every time you get out on the highway, because as soon as that one passed, here come another one. And I was speeding. <laughs> I was breaking the law in the first place. Wow. There's a world out there that has no clue. And in this day and age, we stopped by Walmart on the way back, got a heating pad, and here I am, the guy, I got my mask going in because I'm not going to be one of those that says, oh, I'm not going to wear it. That's wrong. That's definitely not thinking of my brother. I don't think they should force me to wear it either, but that's politics. We're not going to preach that today. But as I'm sitting there, the guy reaches out for the hand pump, so I'm observing. I'm like, so I should sanitize my hands. He said, yes, that's what we would like you to do. I get nudged by the side of somebody passing me to go around. And say, and I was like, wow. <laughs> then I walk in the door good and turn down and go towards the medical supplies and stuff. And there's a guy and a girl, young guy and girl in there. I'm not saying anything about young people. But the boy sitting there, every time somebody comes by with a mask, he goes, <coughs> Wow! That's what people think about other people? Uh, that's the exact opposite of anything love looks like. And it's sure not what love in the church is supposed to look like. A new commandment I give you, to love others as I have loved you. You. That's tough. That's not just being nice to your enemy. That's not just giving him your jacket and then your shirt and let him expose you and be naked. It means laying down and dying for him if it takes it. Why? So that he can see Jesus through you. So that he might be saved for all eternity. That's what Jesus is telling us to live like. And that's what this church definitely is not doing. And that's what so many churches definitely are not doing. In humility, consider others more important than yourself. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, that's okay, but also to the interest of others. Philippians 2 verse 5. Philippians 2, verse 5. Philippians 2, verse 5. Got it? Let this mindset be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who gave up heaven, who didn't have a place to lay his head, who thought constantly of others, who wept for those that were lost, who stood silent before his accusers, who had the power to send down angel armies, who asked his closest friends to pray with him the night before his passion, and they didn't do it, who sweated drops of blood. I've been distressed before, but I have never sweat drops of blood. We know what it, the medical condition is, but I've never been close to that. And he said, Father, take this from me, but not my will, but yours. And then when it got worse, when the pain was too much to bear, when he wasn't even recognizable as a man, he said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. And that's the kind of love that I'm supposed to have. Verse 6, Who existed in the form of God but did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but instead emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even to death on a cross. I've implied this before, but that was the worst kind of death. Not only was it the worst kind of death, you were accursed. 
a man that hung on a tree had no hope. He was accursed from God, desolate. There was no reason to mourn for this man. There was no hope left. And Jesus took all that on for you and I. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him a name above all names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and, er and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not only in presence, but now even more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. James says it this way, if you don't believe Paul's words, because a lot of people say, I, I don't know Paul. He, he, he preaches these strange things. If you look, he preaches Jesus. Jesus crucified, he says it plainly. He wants to know the power of his resurrection by suffering and dying with him. Wow. James says, yes, in, in, ver, in chapter 2, verse 8, yes, indeed, it is good when you obey the royal law, that law of love of following Jesus. <clears throat> the, the royal law found in scriptures, love your neighbor as yourself, but if you favor some people over others, you're committing a sin. So you don't hate them, you don't despise them, you're not mean to them, you just favor one over another. Guilty! <laughs> if you thought it in your heart, you're guilty of it, Correct? You are guilty of breaking the law. For the person who keeps all the law except one is guilty, is as guilty as a person who has broken all of God's laws. For the same God who said you must not commit adultery also said you must not murder. So if you murder someone but do not commit adultery, you have still broken the law. So whatever you say, whatever you do, remember that you will be judged by the law that sets you free. The law that sets you free so that you don't have to be constricted by it anymore. Is that my battery dying again? Don't know? We'll keep trying. If it does it, I'll just yell louder. How's that? Verse 13, there will be no mercy for those who have not shown mercy to others. What does that mean? That means giving them the exact opposite that they deserve. That means when that neighbor down the road is mean and spiteful and hateful and comes and kicks your dog, you go back and pet him and tell him he's a nice guy. You don't have to take what I said literally. But you have to find a way to love your enemies. You have to give them the exact opposite of what they deserve. Because, see, the world gives them what they deserve. Sometimes the world even gives them the good advice of the Samaritan. And they're there for a friend for them and they pick them up out of the mud. But they're not bringing them the light of Jesus. They're bringing them another gospel at best. But if you have been merciful, God will be merciful when He judges you. I will show you the most excellent way. The way of love. The way of Jesus. The way of the cross. Will you follow? Paul said that this is the most excellent way. John said that you can't love God and not love others. James called it the royal law. Jesus commanded you to do it if you were truly his disciple. Merle read this morning in John chapter 15, continuing on from those words, Jesus continued to say there is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. Yes, he's talking about himself, but he's also talking about us. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you slaves because a master does not, doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends. That's John chapter 15. If you know this discourse of, with his disciples in the upper room, Back in John chapter 13, he washed their feet and told them to do the same. He had these words to say. John 13, 34. So now I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other. How? Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world, not to each other, to the world, that you are my disciples. You have to be a disciple if you're ever going to be Christian. can't be like Christ until you've trained and taken up what Jesus teaches. 
And you see that he teaches us to love is how he knows that the world knows that we're his disciples. And then two chapters later, we've changed from disciples to friends of Jesus. I don't know about you, but that's where I want to be as a friend of Jesus. And love is the most excellent way. That's how we're going to do it. That's how Jesus did it. His love should compel us to do it. Disciples to friends by denying myself, letting God have His will over mine, taking up my instrument of suffering and death, and then following in the footsteps, doing acts of love, as Jesus did. So 1 Corinthians chapter 13, that's where we started this week, right? Let's see if I can find it in here. This isn't a phone, this is a hard copy of Merle. Merle's funny because he's got his hard copy, but he always asks Polly to look up something on the phone, so I have to teach it. Because it is handy. And now, I will show you the best way of all. This is Holcomb Standard, I think. No, New Century Version. Now I will show you the best way of all. I may speak in different languages of people, or even angels, but if I do not have this version says love. Yours might say charity. Let me give you the Greek word. Agape. Okay, I'm going to read it that way to give you a little more definition. You don't have to be a Greek scholar. You don't have to be hung on, on these words. But it helps in this situation to understand what word he's using. Because he uses it throughout. I may speak in different languages of people or even angels, but if I do not have agape, I am only a noisy bell or a crashing cymbal. I may have the gifts of prophecy. I may understand all the secret things of God and have all knowledge, and I may have faith so great I can move mountains. But even with all these things, if I do not have agape, then I am nothing. I, am, I may give away everything I have and may even give my body as an offering to be burned, but I gain nothing if I do not have agape. Agape is patient and kind. Agape is not jealous. It does not brag and is not proud. Agape is not rude, it is not selfish, it does not get upset with others. Agape does not count up wrongs that have been done. Agape takes no pleasure in evil, but rejoices over the truth. Agape patiently accepts all things, it always trusts, it always hopes, and it always endures. Now I'm getting close to the video, but I'm not there yet. Here's how the message says it. If I speak with human eloquence and angelic ecstasy, but don't love, I'm nothing but creaking of a rusty gate. If I speak God's word with power, revealing all his mysteries and making everything plain as day, and if I have faith to say to that mountain, jump, and it jumps, but I don't love, I'm nothing. If I give everything I own to the poor and even go to the stake to be burned as a martyr, but I don't love, I've gotten nowhere. So no matter what I say, what I believe, and what I do, I am bankrupt without love. Love never gives up. Love never cares more for love cares more for others than it does for itself. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. Love doesn't strut. Love do, doesn't have a swelled head. Doesn't force itself on others. It isn't always me first. <clears throat> doesn't fly off the handle. Doesn't keep score of the sins of others. Doesn't revel when others grovel takes pleasure in the flowering of truth, puts up with anything. Trust God always, always looks for the best, never looks back, but keeps going to the end. Love never dies. Now the reason that I put agape in there, the reason we're going to do this video, is so you can understand what this love is. This love is the love of Christ that compels us because of the love of God that He would send His only begotten Son. It's an action verb. It's a self-sacrificing love that would die for others. Easiest way put. Exactly what Jesus said. A new commandment I've given you. To agape one another. Do you love each one? Look, take a look. Turn to your left, turn to your right. Do you love each one enough to die for them? That's the kind of love that the church should have. The kind of love that Paul was saying, this is the most excellent way. All these sins and things that you're fighting for, or fighting with, you won't struggle if you love. Love will conquer all of that. 
So I wrote 1 Corinthians 13 this way. What if God was not, but He is? God is so patient with me. He is so kind to me. He doesn't envy someone better than me. He does not boast of His love for me. Instead, He died for me. He is not proud, too proud to call me His very own child. He does not dishonor me, even when I dishonor Him. He is not selfish, but instead lavishly pours His love upon me. He is not eagerly angered with my cheating ways. He doesn't even keep records of my many unfaithful wrongs that I have done against Him. God does not delight in evil. If He did, I would be toast. But instead, He rejoices in what is true and right, and He always protects me. I can always trust in Him completely. I can always have confident hope in His love. His love eternally preserves me. God's love will never, ever fail me. Do you believe this? Is this the love that compels you to live as Christ? Paul goes on in the very next verse of chapter 14 to say, Follow after a God. The NLT says, let love be your highest goal. The message says, go after a life of love as if, as if your life depended on it. Because it does. So I've got a video that will tell you a little bit more about what a cop Do to others what you would want them to do to you. And this, actually, is a restatement of something else that Jesus said, that the meaning of life is to love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, that's really beautiful, but what does he mean exactly by the word love? It's an unclear word in English, because you can love your mom and you can love pizza. And if the word love means the same thing in both of those cases, your mom's going to feel real bad. So what did Jesus mean in his language? Well, first of all, this love your neighbor phrase is a quotation from the Hebrew scriptures, where the word for love is ahava. However, the language Jesus spoke and taught in day to day was a cousin language of Hebrew, that is, Aramaic, in which the word for love is rahma. But then, as Jesus' followers spread his teachings around the world, they translated them to Greek, using the word agap. But here's what's fascinating. The earliest followers of Jesus who wrote the books of the New Testament in Greek, they didn't learn the meaning of agape by looking it up in ancient dictionaries. Rather, they looked to the teachings of Jesus and the story of his life to redefine their very concept of love. So one time, Jesus was asked about the most important command in the Jewish scriptures. And he first quoted from the ancient prayer in the Torah called the Shema. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart. So love for God is the most important thing. But then Jesus quickly followed up by saying another command from the Torah was also the most important, to love your neighbor as yourself. So, which is the most important, loving God or loving your neighbor? Jesus' answer is yes. To ask the question means you don't get his point. For Jesus, there are two sides of the same coin. Your love for God will be expressed by your love for people, and vice versa, they're inseparable. So this makes it clear that for Jesus, agape love is not primarily a feeling for someone else that happens to you, like our phrase, I fell in love. For Jesus, love is action. It's a choice that you make to seek the well-being of people other than yourself. Jesus also went on to teach that genuine love for God and others means seeking people's well-being without expecting anything in return, especially from people who are in difficult situations who can't repay you even if they wanted to. According to Jesus, this kind of generous love reflects the very heartbeat of God. And he took this even further. Jesus said that the ultimate standard of authentic love is how well you treat the person that you can't stand. Or in his words, you shall love your enemy and do good to them, expecting nothing in return. For Jesus, this kind of enemy-embracing love imitates the very character of God himself. Now, we wouldn't be talking about Jesus still today if he had only said things like love your enemy. This is how he actually lived. Jesus was constantly helping and serving people around him in very practical and tangible ways. And he consistently moved towards poor and hurting people who couldn't benefit him in return. He showed love for the forgotten ones, the people who usually fall through the cracks. And when Jesus eventually marched into Jerusalem, he made himself an enemy of the leaders of his people 
or by accusing them of hypocrisy and corruption. But then instead of attacking his enemies to overthrow them, he allowed them to kill him. Jesus died for the selfishness and corruption of his enemies because he loved them. After Easter morning, Jesus and then his followers claimed that it was the power of God's love for the world that was revealed in Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. As the Apostle Paul put it, God demonstrated his own agape for us in this. While we were still sinners, the Messiah died for us. Or in the words of the Apostle John, God's own agape was revealed when he sent his one and only Son into the world so that through him, we could have life. And for John, then, this leads naturally to the conclusion, beloved ones, if that's how God has loved us, then we ought to show love for one another. So Christian faith involves trusting that at the center of the universe is a being overflowing with love for his world, which means that the purpose of human existence is to receive this love that has come to us in Jesus and then to give it back out to others creating an ecosystem of others-focused, self-giving love. And that's the New Testament meaning of agape love. So I made it to 1 Corinthians 14. I'm going to quickly go through the rest of 1 Corinthians just so you remember what's there. Pursue prophecy, but don't silence God. Worship must be out of agape for God with agape for one another. That there's order to it. That it's structured. That it has a purpose. It is to build up and edify one another to, to glorify God. So that when you go out in the world, you live like Christ. Chapter 15. The gospel is Jesus Christ. The message of the cross that we started with in chapter 1. Jesus crucified for you. And resurrected to bring us hope. Because he has to go into that because there's another gospel that's being preached where they said there is no resurrection and people were falling into that gospel. No, Jesus rose from the dead. And if he rose from the dead, then you can trust everything else that he has said. He will return to claim his own. Are you a disciple? Are you a friend of Jesus? Do you belong to him when he comes to claim you? This is what should motivate you to follow it after Him in a life of unselfish, sacrificial love. A love that will transform you where death has no sting because of the message of the cross. Because of the power of the message that is saving those who believe, actively saving you. If we follow the message of the cross, the message of the love, then we will be resurrected also. How, some may ask. Well, consider a seed. When you plant it in the ground, what comes out? Something totally, radically huge, everything. There's no comparison. But the seed has to be planted and die first. What will we be like? Oh, heaven only knows. <laughs> but we can look forward to that time. So Paul wraps up chapter 15 with thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast and immovable. Always excel in the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Self-denying, sacrificial love to one another and to the world so that it leaves them with a question they've got to answer. Jesus really look real? What could make my enemy, instead of cursing me and fighting back, forgive me, love me, have compassion on me? What, what can do that except Christ's love compels them? Chapter 16 talks about showing how to give your love. Every week, take some of your money and set it aside for someone in the church who is in need. It was a church in Jerusalem at that time. Paul said to do it every week. And then he would come by and collect that offering to distribute to those who are suffering. They are fellow workers. He ends a chapter, uh, except for the salutations that follow. Be on alert, stand firm in, in the faith, be men of courage, be strong, do everything in a God. 
sacrificial love of Jesus. Then we get to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And you don't know, i got a little diagram here if I remember. I was going to draw it out on one of my little charts, but my dry erase marker was dead. <laughs> so my slate's clean on it. I wiped it all off and it's ready for the next time. But basically, you had Paul visit this church on his second missionary journey. He spent a year and a half there. He leaves. Other leaders come in. Paulus. But there's division in the church because they like his style over his and all these things. Really? Apollos, Apollos was a fellow worker. It doesn't matter which one plants and which one sees. waters. So a year or so happened. We started in about 50 A.D. and we worked ourselves up to 52 A.D. now, give or take. Then there's a correspondence that you can get from reading. There's this letter about sex issues. This comes before Chloe's letter. Okay? Then there's another letter, a letter of correction that we call 1 Corinthians. It happens another six months to a year later. So we're up to 54, 55 A.D. now, give or take. And you just finished that letter. You saw that it was a letter of rebuke and correction. When you're reading the letter, you're saying, how could the church go this far in such a period of time? But once you head down that path that is not the path of righteousness, it's not the path of the way of love, you'll find how quickly you're in a foreign land lying in the mud. But the good thing is all you've got to do is come to your senses and come back. God is so loving. He's so agape. God is love, and He demonstrates His love for us. And while we were still enemies, He sent His one and only Son to die for us. Then Paul, a little later, we'll just say months later, maybe a year, uh, he says, I'm fixing to bring back the stick. Because you're not listening. We don't have this letter, but it was his painful letter. Unless you think 1 Corinthians was his painful letter. I don't think it was, because it was not that painful. It was rebuking, and it warned, do you want me to come back this way? So then he wrote a letter, in my opinion, that says, I'm coming back this way. Then we've got his second visit, where he comes. The painful visit. Then he goes and he writes a fourth letter because of the report that he gets from the church, from another co-worker that went there. And he writes this letter that starts with suffering. The reason I tell you all this is to get there because it's like there's an abrupt here. Why is Paul talking about suffering now? But if you're truly moving towards a life of love, you're going to suffer. And don't be mistaken because you're not suffering on the foreign mission field. He may or may not be calling you to do that. But you will be suffering. Whether it's health, whether it's family, whether it's a job loss, whatever it is. You will suffer. And each one of the body of Christ needs to realize that. Not gossip about it. Not make light of it. But suffer with that person. You don't have the words to say? Don't say it. As you see in this chapter where it leads to is prayer. That's the best thing you could ever do. Because when you don't know what to do and you don't even know what to pray, the Holy Spirit will pray for you. Because your heart compels you to have mercy for that person. You don't want them to have that pain. And that's where Paul's at in 2 Corinthians. He tells us about suffer. Now I read to you before about the way of love that Jesus taught. So we go back to that again so you see Jesus' words compared to Paul's. John 15 was, there is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one friend's. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends. Two chapters previous, he called them disciples. So now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love one another. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Do you know what's found right in between John chapter 15 and John chapter 13? 14. Thank you. John chapter 14. Here's what John chapter 14 says. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father and he will send you a what? Comforter. Oh, here's where we're at in 2 Corinthians. 
We need comfort because suffering will come. I don't know if suffering was there at that church already. Paul hints to there is some suffering. And probably because their suffering probably came from the body of Christ, believe it or not. Because all of a sudden, Joe over here started getting serious about Jesus. And his brother said, you don't have to get that serious about Jesus. Really? You don't? Are you working out your salvation in fear and trembling then? Will there be weeping and gnashing of teeth when the day that Jesus returns, even though you've done mighty miracles in His name? If you can speak in tongues of all known languages and, and angels, but don't have love, you're just noise. If you have all prophecy, all knowledge, and enough faith to say jump that building, to jump to this side of the culvert, and it does, and you don't have love, you are nothing. And if you don't have love, even if you give up your body to be sacrificially marked, but you don't do it out of love, you will leave this world bankrupt of messages. Empty. Maybe you'll be saved as through the flames. Maybe you won't. Because it should be Christ's love that compels His disciples to become His friends, to take, to deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow after the way of sacrificial love. Not a funny feeling. The kind of love that when I am persecuted for it, that it compels me even more to live like Jesus. Friends of Jesus suffer. And that's where this church is at. And here's where we're going to be reading until we get to the point where we realize that we're ambassadors. Suffering comes so that God can comfort us. It says in 2 Corinthians that God is the source of all comfort. That's why Jesus, the first name for the Holy Spirit was the Comforter. Because He was telling His disciples at that point all the things that He would suffer and die and how they would have to follow How can you comfort one another unless God is first comforting you? You know, when we did the youth ministry, one of the things that we could comfort them with was our testimony from the past because of the things that we went through. How could we relate to them otherwise? And how could we comfort them when we didn't know anything about it until we'd been through the same thing? Maybe, just maybe, the reason that you're suffering, and I don't know if you are or not right now, but the, the time will come if you're following Christ, is simply so that you can comfort someone else. Have you ever thought about that? So if you don't live this life, if you don't suffer so that you can be com com uh, comforted, then are you really a disciple of Jesus? Are you really His friend? <laughs> you're definitely not really like Christ be honest. And what does a church look like today? Does it look like the Corinthian church? Or does it look like Jesus? We all know the answer of what it should look like. The church should look like Jesus. Period. And if we don't look like Jesus here, the world's going to see through our hypocrisy. We like to point fingers at the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the, the teachers and the scribes but the world looked up to them for what was right. Jesus said, unless you surpass the righteousness of the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. The world thought they were righteous. We tend to say, oh yeah, we see all that. It's easy to point out somebody else's sins. It's hard to look at our own. So I challenge you as you read, to consider any suffering that's in your life, any suffering that's in anyone else's life that you see, and how you can bring comfort to them as God has comforted you. That you are His ambassador. We'll get to that in chapter 5. And that doesn't mean you need to know all the answers. You don't need to know the juicy gossip. 
You don't need to have a degree to, to fix their problems. Maybe you just need to cry with them. Maybe you need to cry silently for them. I told John something the other day, and I remember the first thing he did was cry. Remember what I'm talking about? You know, that meant so much to me because he felt my pain. And I'm sure that he has prayed for me since because I have felt his pain and I have prayed for him because that's where this chapter goes. Paul tells all about those that are suffering for Jesus and how it's led the church to pray for them. The Christian suffers so that he can com be comforted by God so that he can comfort others because it strengthens us so that we can find joy even in taking up the cross. Yeah. I've got to find this. I'm going to close with this. Remember, you know who Chuck Colson is, right? We played this movie before here. i got a copy of it if anybody wants it. There's no reason he went to jail. He didn't have to go to jail. Yeah, he did. That was God's plan. I was reading an article by Chuck Colson not long ago in which he said that he often asked himself why he had to go to a prison, go to prison as a result of Watergate. Legally, there was no reason why he should have to be in prison. Nevertheless, he ended up there. And for a long time, he struggled with that. Why do we have to suffer? Why did he have to suffer the humiliation, the shame, the disgrace, and the discontent of prison? But the answer began to come. While he was in prison, he learned that what prisoners go through. He saw these forgotten men and women of American society, the awful injustices they often face, the difficulty, even the impossibility of recovering them themselves, and there was born in him a great sense of compassion and desire to help. Agape. <clears throat> Since he has gotten out of prison, he has devoted his whole life, not the things that mattered anymore, not the idols he had in his life, and his ministry to going back in and helping these men. Now wonderful stories are being, be, beginning to come out from prisons all over America. A dramatic change in human lives because Chuck Colson was sent to prison. Would he have ever had that agape if he hadn't gone to prison? Probably not. Will there be souls in eternity because he did? Probably yes. Why in the world would you want to chase after idols that mean nothing instead of living like Jesus in this world? That is why God sends us into difficulties at times. Not always for our sake, but someone else's sake. We have been bought, brought along and matured to the point where we can take it, rejoice in it, and handle it with compassion. When we do, what a lesson we are giving to those who are following along or watching. Here's where we're at in 2 Corinthians. As you read this week, like I said, ask God about the suffering that's in your life, the suffering that's in others' lives, and let it compel you to a God thing. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for you are a faithful, holy, righteous, loving that you would do for us the things that you've done for us through Jesus' suffering and humiliation and death. Father, we are so blessed. And then that you would adopt us and call us your own. Let us work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Let us realize and believe that our life is not our own, that it's not our will but your will. Lord, help us to live as Jesus. Help us to unite and strengthen one another, comfort one another, to love as Christ loved and gave himself for us. In Jesus' name we pray.
Go now, for a little while you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold that is refined by fire may be proven genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy, for you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Oh, is that what it was? Yeah. 